Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. So I've noticed in the past couple years of uploading these videos that by far the ones that have done the best are the ones about real interview questions. And so I thought I'd come back with a third edition today about specifically React. So let's get into some real front end interview questions. So a couple caveats. One, these are either real questions that I have asked in past jobs or have been asked in past interviews or examples of questions that I would ask if I were creating questions for a React interview, which I've done before. So I think the point is that you can be fairly well assured, I think, that these are examples of real things that you would come across in real interviews to be a React developer. Also, these are not your typical algorithm heavy CS kind of questions. These are practical day-to-day -day questions that reflect things that you would actually need to know to do a developer job. I'm not really one for the algorithm heavy interview. And so these are reflective of my experience, which has been much more on the practical side. So just wanted you to know that going in. Okay, so the first question is, what is JSX? And I know for those of you that have done a lot of React in the past, this probably seems like not even worth asking, but I think there are a couple kind of good things that you can end up getting out of this question. So the answer is that it stands for JavaScript and XML. So it kind of provides this XML-like syntax for you to write your JavaScript and render things out to the DOM. So that I'd say is like more or less the most basic answer. One step further is that people that have done React for a while might know that it's essentially just a syntactic sugar over react.create element. And so people that know that it actually is just a syntactic sugar for react.create element would probably know that ultimately your React code is compiled down into that. And so at each point, React is simply creating elements under the hood, even though it looks like we're just writing basically HTML. So I think there's opportunity to shine in this question by showing that you have an in-depth knowledge of what is actually going on under the hood. Another question kind of in this vein and a little bit more on the beginner side, but one that I still think is important is why is class class name in React? And the answer is that class is a reserved keyword in JavaScript. And if you know that your JSX ultimately is getting compiled down to JavaScript, there would be a conflict if you simply use class to do your CSS styling because class is a reserved keyword in JavaScript. So JavaScript would think that you're trying to create a JavaScript class and not style an element. So for that reason, class is class name in JSX. So again, this is kind of a compilation question, but I think another way to shine here might be to say something like, uh, you know, under the hood Babel, is doing the transpilation, ultimately turning into JavaScript, showing that you know a little bit more about what is happening behind the scenes and not just consuming these great tools. Okay, my third question is describe data flow in React. And so at the very most basic level, the answer is going to be that the data flow is unidirectional. And I've actually gotten this question in the past. So what does this mean? This means that all of the components in React have a parent-child relationship. And typically what is happening is that you're passing data down from above, unidirectional going in one direction, right? So all the data is flowing downwards. And so this would be a great opportunity to mention props and state. So typically like the most basic way that we're passing information down is through props, but there's an opportunity here to go deeper in talking about global state management, which I've talked about in the past. How is it that you share data multiple layers deep? And then how do you end up avoiding prop drilling where you're just passing a prop down like 10 levels? That would be a great opportunity to talk about context and global state and Redux. And so this is kind of an open-ended question. You can take this wherever you want, but I think at the very most basic level, the data flow is unidirectional. You need to hit on that. But beyond that, you can talk a lot about how data is managed in React locally in component state and then all the way up to global app state. So you can really take this and run with it as long as you know your stuff. And I would encourage you to research this particular area if it's a little foreign to you. My fourth question, again, this is maybe a little bit basic on the surface, but I think there's opportunity to do interesting stuff. So the question is, how would you delay an API call until a component has mounted? And so there are two different ways you can answer this question. The traditional way in a class would be using component did mount. And when you start to get into component did 
and Mount, I think you have a great opportunity to talk about life cycle methods and really show an in-depth understanding of how the component life cycle works. So you definitely need to hit on component did mount, which essentially is a function that runs after the component is mounted that allows you to then run other code and kind of do whatever you want after that point. So you make sure that you're not making your API call before the component has mounted and kind of missing the appropriate stage in the life cycle to render data out. The second way that I would answer this question, and I would hit on both, is that now that we have functional components and hooks that you don't need to write classes anymore, you don't need component did mount. And so the way that you would do this is to use the use effect hook and pass an empty array as the second argument. And what that does is it essentially mimics component did mount. And so then inside of the use effect, you could write your API call and it would work basically just the same way. Now, you've also got an opportunity here to talk about hooks and show off your hooks knowledge. So I would make sure to mention that you know that when you pass certain variables to the array as the second argument in use effect, that you know that use effect will run when those change. Also, I would touch on the fact that ideally you know how to replicate the other lifecycle methods using use effect, which is possible. So I would make sure to touch on that as well. I would brush up on your knowledge there. If maybe you are a little bit weak at this point, I think it's definitely gonna be great to know how to use the most modern iteration of components, which at this point is functional components with hooks. And my fifth question, it's a little bit of a trick question, but I love this question. It actually comes up practically a lot. And that is, should you use ternaries or the and operator to conditionally render React components? And I actually got this from a Kent C. Dodds blog post, but it's something that comes up all the time. And that is that you should use ternaries because if you use the and operator, you end up encountering this certain kind of problem where essentially if you're checking for, let's say the length of an array, if you want to render things out, if you use the and operator, what happens is if the length is zero, JavaScript knows that zero and something is always going to be falsy. And so it doesn't even bother evaluating the right side of the expression and rendering anything out. And so essentially what happens is that just a zero gets rendered to the page. And I'm sure if you've done React for any amount of time, this has happened to you. It's happened to me a lot. And Kent C. Dodds actually mentions in this blog post that he shipped this bug to production at PayPal, which I thought was kind of funny. And it just goes to show you the importance of making sure that these things are kind of all buttoned up. But I think it's a really, really common pattern to just say, okay, we're gonna use the and operator, but ternaries is actually the best because it helps you to avoid this specific bug. So I'll go ahead and link that below. It's definitely worth a read. A few of my colleagues have mentioned that this blog post has been really helpful to them. So I would definitely check it out. So these are kind of five interview questions that I would ask or have been asked, and I hope you find them helpful. Of course, you know if someone really knows React by how they write it. And so talking about it in kind of a conversational way might not be the best way to evaluate. There's take home projects, there's other stuff. I'll do future videos on how to navigate those. But typically in a lot of interviews, in my experience, there's at least some kind of spoken part. And so if I were doing kind of a more conversational interview, these are specific kinds of questions that I would ask. So like I said, hope you found them helpful. If you're still here, you'd probably like the rest of my channel. So consider subscribing. Thanks so much for watching to the end and I'll see you in the next one.